can be maybe start by reflecting a little bit on uh, the fellowship, but this issue of public service. So why, why do you think it's, uh, it's become so difficult to attract good people and, and not in good, good favor? Well, the, the, the whole area I've reinforced in my mind recently, I, I've been not quite ready to announce it, but very soon working to get a new, I'll call it Institute of Public Administration. We're not going to call it that because I had discovered Public administration is actually a bad word. And most people have bad two, bad two words. They don't understand that they kind of have the feeling they're the people that sweep the floor or something. <laughs> Public administrators have no resonance. And I think it's interesting because I think that reflects the fact that government administration, government management, whatever you want to call it, has been neglected through the years. And it shows. It shows in a lot of ways, but the examples that I like to take is two clear management failures. Katrina and uh, New Orleans, and we have, after all, a big government agency to deal with emergencies. When an emergency came along, they didn't deal with it. And then we had this other thing I didn't know anything about, but the oil spill in the Gulf, there is a government agency that's supposed to be <laughs> Uh, regulating that and preventing that kind of a catastrophe and dealing with it promptly and effectively or it happens. And you had the emergency and I think it revealed a failure in government administration. Now there are lots of successes too, but it's the failures that get all the attention and contribute to this what I call malaise about government generally. That's not the only reason obviously there are all these ideological differences and political problems and all the rest. but. But government in this country, or in fact elsewhere, just does not get the respect that it should get in an effectively functioning democracy, in my view. Uh, and it's a subject, I think, that's received too little attention. And if we can marshal a little interest in the subject, and I think there begins to be a little interest in the subject, I think it's a worthwhile thing to do. So what, what kind of steps do you think we need to do to, to turn the situation around? Well, you know, it's not going to be easily turned around, but this commission that I headed in 2003 or whenever it was, was pretty simple. Uh, the last time the federal government was really looked at seriously was back just before World War II and after World War II, when there was this famous Hoover Commission. And the kind of structure of the federal government was set up then. You, you would take all this for granted, but that's when you first had a White House office and the Bureau of the Budget was created and put hmm. in the White House. Uh, and that whole, and different departments were established. And importantly, the president then was given reorganization authority. So he could propose a change in agencies or departments and send it to the Congress and the Congress would vote it up or down. That authority doesn't exist anymore, so it just makes it more difficult to make change and adaptations to the tremendous changes that are going on in the world at large and the economy and technological areas and all the rest that you know more about than I do. But uh, So in that commission back then, we said one thing you do is we want to combine a lot of departments and agencies and try to avoid the overlapping that exists, including in banking regulation. But that success there would probably rely, be dependent upon presidential reorganization authority, which he never got, and which there's been no change for. And there are a lot of things you can do in terms of pay and performance measurement and all that stuff, which uh, we paid some attention to. Uh, what stands out now, we thought it was a problem then, it was a problem then, but now it's a, just an agonizing, terrible problem with the appointment process. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, who, even if you've got an interest in government, you've got to think nine times before you want to go through that. And it's not just all the vetting beforehand, all the care that has to be taken, it takes months, and then you run into a political dogfight. Well, you run that risk anyway when you get appointed, uh, get nominated. It's not, a, it's not a recipe for very effective government. 
obviously we're not the only people that say that, but nothing gets done. <laughs> and, and, in the sense, it's different in other countries, or well, I, you know, they're all the European governments, the British government is quite different. It's, in the French government, they all had this uh, system of very strong management, non-political, and great pride in public service. And the British government just used to have, you know, one political minister, and the next most important guy was the top civil servant. Right. Now that's changed some change quite a lot. Uh, but some of them have the opposite problem that they've been uh, too much, too little interaction between the private and the public sector. Uh, but they also have the same problem of kind of lack of respect of government. Uh, I discovered, unbeknownst to me, until I began looking around, there is a new institution that's created in, in the UK in quite different government circumstances, everything's centralized, it's all uh, much more straightforwardly arranged than in the United States, and all the checks and balances, no local government that amounts to anything, no, no state governments. Uh, but this is uh, a very wealthy guy who had spent some time as a minister in various governments, had the same sense that I'm reporting, that the government just is not functioning very well. And he had enough money, he went out and set up a big, I guess the equivalent of a think tank, called Institute for Government. And he has been trying to make an impact on, on the, the British bureaucracy, to use that word. You know, I ran into a quotation the other day that expressed uh, my view <laughs> entirely, it expressed much more eloquently than I did from Thomas Edison years ago. He said, vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> and I think that's about where we are. We've got lots of vision in the United States. We haven't got much execution. And we've got to begin to understand that. That's great. Right. Obviously agree. It's just tremendous. It has been tremendously rewarding. I think both of us can testify to get up in the morning and know that when you come to work, how well you do your job has some effect on the public welfare. It's a little scary, right? But it's very... Rewarding. Well, it's kind of scary. I mean, you talk about getting up in the morning. When I was in the Treasury, I'm the Secretary of Monetary Affairs, and the monetary system was kind of falling apart. <laughs> if I got a call before I went to work, if I got a call uh, you know, at 7, 7.30, it would be a guy named Paige Nelson, who followed the markets, and he would have overnight gotten a message as to whether any foreign country wanted to exchange their dollars for gold. <laughs> and we were running out of gold, so that was not a good news. But he never called to say somebody didn't call. <laughs> <laughs> if the phone rang, I knew it was bad news. <laughs> that he'd gotten into the office and gotten the message. <laughs> well, that's a good transition, actually, into, the, into another topic, which is the international monetary system. Yes. So you spent your years in the Treasury in the early 60s right. and late 60s and early 70s trying to create a more flexible but also stable international financial system. Yes. I think it's fair to say we haven't gotten very yes. far since you left the government <laughs> in 1973. I agree so, you know, it's like the banking crisis in a way, and the regulatory crisis. Uh, and this is ancient history in a way, but we had this Bretton Woods system where it pivoted around the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar was convertible into gold, and that was the symbol and in part the substance of the of a fixed uh, exchange rate system. And the pressures became too great. Everybody wanted to run a surplus, and everybody can't run a surplus, and uh, so-called nth country was the United States, we were running the deficits. And, and so there was inevitably, in my view, a break where we had to go off gold, uh, which we did. But that came at a time, first of all, the reaction to that should have been a determination to conduct discipline policies in the United States. But it had the actual opposite reaction. In fact, President Nixon was the president, and he was facing re-election. 
And he decided this was a way to uh, have a few expansionary policies, and the Federal Reserve was somewhat involved in this too. So instead of uh, being, I think, properly disciplined during that period, we weren't. But behind that lay a, an ideological concept that if we left exchange rates alone, uh, you didn't have to worry about international monetary arrangements because fluctuations in the exchange rate would seamlessly and smoothly take care of any differences in economic and financial conditions in different countries. Milton Friedman was a great proponent of this. And so that was kind of seemed politically an easy out. We didn't have to worry about it anymore. But you know, that was wrong. We did have to worry. We had a lot of fluctuations in exchange rates, and then particularly we had a lot of a lack of restraint gave rise to the inflationary problem. And so whatever the ideology was, things got out of hand. And, and that was a lesson I, I hope we have learned. Needs repetition every once in a while, I suspect. But it, it then led to the problems of the 80s. But even now, I'm giving a lecture instead of answering your question, but uh, <laughs> that's good. I'll add to the We're lecture a little bit. Just bring that up to date. And why are we in the situation we're in now financially? And how did we have this big bust, this big breakdown? Uh, there's too little attention, in my view, to the fact that it was too easy for us to borrow and too easy for China and other Asian countries to lend to us during this period because they love to export and they were perfectly happy to hold dollars. Interest rates are very low, credit standards got less and less. And no, it went on because it was, you know, it's like losing blood. It feels good for a while until you run out. Uh, <laughs> and, and we were running out and it, it fed this speculation, particularly in the housing market. And sure, the regulators were a little asleep and the bankers were a little excessive, to say the least. But behind that lay this easy finance that was related to the international monetary system. How, you know, sitting back, you can ask, I asked the question, maybe nobody else asked the question. How did we ever think it made a lot of sense that China, in the space of, I don't know, six or seven years, would pile up foreign exchange reserves at three trillion dollars. I mean, we never used to measure this stuff in trillions. And we had balance of payments deficits running to five and six hundred thousand dollars a year. And of course, the foreigners ended up owning half the national debt. I mean, it doesn't, it just doesn't sound right to me anyway. I mean, it reflects some, uh, some imbalances that we should be concerned about. And you see that same process within the limits of the Eurozone. The same lack of discipline there has led to too much borrowing by the southern countries, too easy credit, a boom, now a bust. And uh, it's about time we began worrying about the international monetary system, in my view. The other night, you and I, last week, you and I heard a lecture in which... On that subject on that subject in which the lecturer uh, advocated sort of retaliatory intervention. China was intervening, we should intervene trying to sell. I mean, so what are we going, how are we going to get discipline into the system? Well, this is of course the, the problem. I, I, I say we need more discipline, that's great. Who's going to apply to discipline? Right. <laughs> well, on, on both sides, both on from the both, US uh, absolutely. and China. I, I like to quote this old statement by Karl Marx. Everybody loves Karl Marx. <laughs> he said, if you give capitalists enough rope, they'll hang themselves. And there was some truth to that. And we were given a lot of rope, and, and the Spanish were given a lot of rope, and the Italians were given a lot of rope, the Greeks were given a lot of rope, they're succeeding in, in hanging themselves. But you know, the question is, who's the disciplinarian? Now, in the early post-war period when I was in the United States, when I was in the Treasury and the United States was still strong, I guess implicitly we looked upon ourselves as we were the great wise people and the United States was running the system and we had the power and authority to do it. Now, that's no longer true. So a lot of talk, well, the IMF ought to do it. 
The IMF is obviously the designated international agency for this kind of thing. But, you know, you can admire the IMF all you want. And some people don't like it and some people like it, but it has not got the political force, it hasn't got the divisions <laughs> there to effectively discipline the United States or China or Europe and it can discipline some small developing country, even there it's getting more difficult. So you got this enormous political, geopolitical problem of how do you get a system that's both flexible, as you said, but stable and disciplined. And we made some proposals 30 years ago, but they didn't go very far, and Fred Bergston was saying, in effect, uh, the IMF ought to do it first, but if the IMF can't do it, the United States ought to get in there and fight wars in the exchange market. It made everybody squirm a little bit, I think, is what <laughs> say, but, but he's on to a, a real problem. Now, when you were uh, at the Treasury, but even more at the Federal Reserve, exchange market intervention was an actively used tool. So we had the Plaza Accord to help reduce the value of the dollar and then move to try and stabilize it. It has fallen into, at least in the U.S., into disuse and G20, G7, G8 statements saying you shouldn't use it. Do you think that's overdone? Well, is there a place um, for it? it's an interesting subject. We've gone back and forth on this in the United States and in the world. Should, is intervention useful or not useful? In what conditions is it useful and all the rest? And of course, when you were back on fixed exchange rates, you had to intervene. I mean, that was part of maintaining the fixed exchange rates. But when we went off into floating, then the big argument began. And the ideologues, who were all in favor of floating, says never intervene to right. uh, carry it to the extreme. And the United States, for a while, rather adopted that view. And then particularly, I think, in the Clinton administration, it kind of wasn't 180 degrees reversed, but they were much more relaxed about intervention and, and did a fair amount of intervention when particular exchange rates, like the Japanese yen or others, seemed to be getting out of line. Uh, but most of the intellectual uh, argument, and there were a number of studies and commissions internationally, said it really doesn't do much good. Uh, if it's going to do any good, it's got to be accompanied by the right policies, which I, I, I agree with. And then during the early uh, Reagan years, it was an ideological very strong ideological feeling that you'd never intervene under any circumstance. The market would take care of itself. Well, it's, it's interesting the difference of personalities make when Jim Baker became Secretary of the Treasury. He didn't, uh, he didn't share that philosophy, so a certain amount of intervention began. This is an interesting area because both the Federal Reserve and the Treasury have authority, or have interpreted law to give them authority to intervene, and who's in charge? And the Treasury, when I was in the Treasury, I said the Treasury's in charge. When I was in the Federal Reserve, I said the Federal Reserve is in charge. <laughs> the truth is, you're not going to be successful unless you both agree and participate. Yep. Yep. And they didn't both participate, the market would immediately say, what's the matter? It's a, bit, it's a big fight, so you have to do it together. That's a kind of side point. But uh, it, is, it has to be backed up as, as real policy if you're going to do it. Uh, I always tell the story that <laughs> when, the, when the Reagan administration agreed to begin intervening again after this long period of not intervening, you know, Margaret Thatcher recently died and there's a lot of talk about how close she was to, to Reagan. And in January of 85, I guess it was, the British pound was approaching a dollar. And that was a symbolic disaster to Margaret Thatcher. The, the great noble pound sterling, which used to be worth five five dollars, would be worth one dollar. And she called up Ronnie and said, "Do something!" <laughs> and Ronnie called up Jim Baker <laughs> and said, "What can we do?" And we intervened. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a brief episode, but then later he. 
as you say, at the plaza and then later at the Louvre, he became convinced, which I, I was in full agreement on this, that we should, it was a responsibility of the government to take some action to avoid these really big swings and destabilizing swings in exchange rates. So we did it for a while, but then that kind of dropped out. Right. Too. Right. So let's move on to monetary policy. Um, Getting very sensitive now. <laughs> very sensitive. <laughs> but let's start in the 1970s, and we can work. We can work our way forward a little bit. So as. Uh, uh, Wilmuth, uh, Dean Wilmuth said, uh, Professor Wilmuth said, this is, the inflation had built up in the 1970s, you took uh, decisive action to end it. So I think my first question is, why do you think it was allowed to build up as much as it did? And Well, you no, know, Obviously, always a variety of reasons, and I already talked a little bit about the ideology, which kind of led to a helpless feeling, a standoff feeling. But Arthur Burns had been the chairman of the Federal Reserve during most of that period, and was obviously hard pressed by his friend Richard Nixon. But he gave a very interesting speech, which I listened to just when I became chairman, which he worked very hard on as a lecture. He called it the agony of central banking. And the thesis of the speech was, in a big modern day democracy, for political, but also for structural reasons, you will have inflationary pressures that could not easily be controlled by monetary policy. You think of monetary policy responsibility is stable prices, but he made the argument you know, with the kind of strong unions you had, the wage pressures that you had, the political support for that process, the government taking on too many things, the deficits running more or less out of control. I'd have to go back and read the speech, but in fact he said, well, you know, it's really impossible for the Federal Reserve or any central bank to do the job that was necessary and constraining inflation. And then you had two oil crises, which that was another thing. They couldn't deal with the oil crisis and send the prices way up and how to get all these things going on, which limited the authority and ability of the Federal Reserve or any central bank. But of course, by the end of the 70s, the cumulative process had become great enough so that the, uh, the population was really upset. And you had that period when President Carter then went up to Camp David and up on the mountain and communed for two weeks and came back and made this speech about the United States was in, I forget the words he used, but... Malays. Well, he never used the word Malays, but it was, it was called the Malay speech. But the word Malays never appeared in his speech, but it was an appropriate description of the speech already. Uh, and he made some changes, and for whatever reasons, I ended up chairman of the Federal Reserve. But, uh, you know, you I, I thought, you know, we got to do something about this. The inflation rate was running 50% at annual rate uh, each quarter then. And the economy was lousy for the, it wasn't, I don't know, lousy is the right word, it was not very good, and so you had this so called stagflation. You know, I'm going to be chairman, and the Federal Reserve is supposed to do something about that. <laughs> so you obviously didn't buy Burns's argument. No, well, I didn't want to. I, the brand new chairman of the Federal Reserve, I didn't want to be in charge of an agency that had no authority. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> which was the burden of his, his speech, really. No, so I, I didn't really buy it. Uh, and so we set off. You know the story, we, we had a couple of discount rate changes right off the bat, which made no impression on, on anything. Uh, they almost were counterproductive because everybody said, well, if that's all they can do, it's not doing anything. <laughs> so... Uh, it was that four to three vote on yeah, this. We had this crucial... I mean, I was naive in those days, and the last increase in discount rate, they were coming in rapid order, it was four to three vote. And I thought, good, we got all these three changes in two months. Uh, 
people to really sit up and listen. No, they said, four to three vote, that's the last one. <laughs> you won't be able to get another vote through. So, you know, we've got to do something more dramatic than that. We've got to get people's attention, so we change this. Now, I had no idea, obviously, at that time, I knew that in the short run, the interest rates would go up. I had no idea that they were going to reach 20%. I mean, I probably would have committed suicide if I thought that was the <laughs> process. But once you get caught up in it, you you follow through. So, so you the the paradigm shift was to shift to money supply targeting, using reserves to target yeah. the money supply. And the reason for that, in my view, and I, you know, the pure monetary said, well, that that will solve everything, and. So and so on, but it was a clear lack of discipline and lack of understanding in the public as to what to do about it. Lack of discipline in the Federal Reserve itself. I mean, how many times do we vote keep the money supply down and never came down? I mean, and I thought, you know, we had to discipline ourselves basically by making a point, a big point, and if we didn't live up to it, we had to live up to it once we made the point. But I also it was a much simpler message for the public. I mean, an argument that raising interest rates is good to tackle inflation <laughs> doesn't resonate <laughs> among the public. It doesn't resonate above anybody. But the idea that inflation is a monetary phenomenon and it's got something to do with the money supply, and if you're going to constrain inflation, you've got to constrain the money supply. So that was the message. We're going to constrain the money supply, and we're going to do it in a way that once having said so, the Federal Reserve itself couldn't duck the, <laughs> the implication of that. And we had a message for the public that the, I think was sort of comprehensible. It was only comprehensible because they were so upset about the inflation, of course, to start with. So it was kind of a good, turned out to be a good time to become chairman of the Federal Reserve because, because the conditions were bad and they were worried so they were willing to accept somebody doing something. And if Burns had tried that three years earlier, he probably would have been sent out of town on the railroad because it wasn't that bad or four years earlier. Had to get bad enough before you could, you could act. My recollection is that people weren't quite so accepting as you portray. <laughs> so I think we had tractors around the Federal yeah, Reserve no, no. building, consumer no. groups. Yeah, you did. I mean, uh, no, and there was a lot of, you know, kind of noisy opposition. But I always felt, I still feel, <laughs> that while there was a lot of noise, there was a kind of underlying understanding which President Reagan had, that there was a problem, somebody's trying to deal with it, let's give them a chance. And we won't really put them in jail yet. Now, <laughs> if it, it had gone on much longer. You know, the, the Congress never, there were all kinds of resolutions proposed in the Congress and in a lot of state legislatures. They never passed, I don't think they were ever even brought to a vote. Uh, where they could have been because there was this this feeling and I I can't imagine I, I don't know it wasn't there but I wasn't in the White House but I assumed every time President Reagan had a press conference all his political friends were talking now this is your chance to attack the Federal Reserve get after them and he never did it and I don't remember many words of praise but there was no <laughs> <laughs> there was no uh, it was supportive in the sense that he didn't do that. And he didn't do it because he had, I think, this simple feeling. He used to say that I, when I went to this little college and went to in Illinois or wherever it was, that my economics professor kept telling me inflation was a bad thing, avoid inflation. And I learned that when I was in college. So that was a good thing to learn in college. <laughs> uh, and, well, I, I mean, I, I tell this story and it sounds self whatever. Uh, the home builders were the most affected as now because you can't do much residential home building with interest and mortgage rates of 15%. Uh, and they were upset and they sent in all these two by fours and so forth. But actually the leaders, I was lucky, the leadership was quite responsible and they had some understanding of what the problem was and what we were after. 
And they invited me to go out and speak to their annual convention in, of all places, Las Vegas. <laughs> and 83 or whatever time it was. And, and this is on my mind because as I, I was walking there to go to the room to, to uh, address them. There was a senator there who was not, not on the friendly side. He said, what are you doing out here? You're going to get crucified by these guys. And he didn't know I was just walking down the speaker. And I gave my speech, and you know, things are tough, I know, but we've got to keep with it because if we stick with it long enough, inflation rate goes down, we'll all benefit, and uh, you'll build a lot of houses and all the rest. And this should have been, you know, could have been a very antagonistic audience, stood up and applauded. I mean, and that was just a reflection, I think. I was probably more eloquent than usual that day, but. Uh, <laughs> But it was reflective of this feeling that you know, here is the industry most affected uh, that let me speak on their platform and kind of understood. And, uh, I, you know, I had to believe somebody believed. <laughs> so, uh, no, but I, I really think it was true that uh, there's a lot of flurry. A classmate of mine used to buy full pages and. Wall Street Journal once in a while with a skull and crossbones and my picture and said, we got to get this guy. But I, I never knew him in college, so it was all right. <laughs> you just emphasized the importance of telling the public a story they could understand. And that brings up two issues in my mind that bear on the present day. One is the degree of transparency at the Federal Reserve about their actions, what they expect to do in the future has increased tremendously since the time you were inside. It evolved to some degree over Alan Greenspan's years, but even more under Ben Bernanke. So I'd be interested in your perspective on whether this is helping the public understand. Well, well, and, that, and the second well, uh, part of that related is, do you think the public understands what the Fed is doing today and why? Well, let me make a general statement that covers all this thing, related to what I just said. It is terribly important that the Federal Reserve and any central bank have the confidence of the public and are considered above politics and an institution with both confidence and integrity. And in today's Washington, those are rare qualities and they've always been uh, important qualities, but they're particularly important now. And it's not, it wasn't me in the Federal Reserve, it was that people respected the Federal Reserve through the years and they respected, you know, it's got its ups and downs, but basically, this is a governmental institution that has some continuity and some respect, and there are damn few of them right now that, that can do that. So whatever the particular techniques are, that is fundamentally important. Now, it's true that I have some reservations about how hard you tried to explain policy over Every time you made a statement, you had to say what you were going to do in the next three years or something, which I think only ties you in knots and doesn't... You ought to say, I oversimplify, but you say, this is what we're doing today, this is what we think is necessary today. When we change it, we'll tell you. Uh, but, but you don't have to try to say uh, what every little condition is. Uh, before you change, or you get, once you say what you're going to do in the next two or three years, if you don't do that, then the market, oh, they're double crossing us, and, and you lose the kind of, instead of gaining the respect, you lose the respect. Now, that's my peculiar defensive point of view. But, um, do you think the public understands what the Fed's doing today? Well, well, of course, what they understand, I mean, they go back to, the emphasis we put on controlling the money supply and all the rest. And now uh, the Federal Reserve, whatever else value has, is not, it's not a paragon of controlling the money supply. And so it's got this message that it's dangerous to have too much money creation. That depends on how you define money right now, but you're certainly are providing the potential tinder for a big increase in the money supply. They do, there is. I mean, in markets, they understand. I don't know what the average person thinks 
but I think some of them think so too. It's, a, it's an unusual, unique, historic position for the Federal Reserve to be in and creating this tremendous potential supply of money. And, and because we deliberately got the message through that money is important about inflation, now, now you've got the other side of that. Well, money's all that important. What are these guys doing? Now, I think you've gotten by with it okay so far. It, it's, it's interesting, despite that feeling, confidence and price stability seems to be maintained. But that's the crucial point. Can you maintain that confidence and price stability? And so far, yes, but, you know, I don't know how, so how in, far you can go. Yeah, in that regard, the Federal Reserve has made a lot of, put a lot of emphasis on the so-called dual mandate. Yes. And, uh, I'm against the dual mandate. Uh -huh. So you prefer just price stability? Well, I prefer it properly understood. Uh, I think keep repeating this mantra of a dual responsibility is confusing. You always lead to, are they leaning in this direction this month and we got some bad economic news are they going to lean in the other direction? And over time it's an illusion that federal you can't trade off inflation for growth, in my humble opinion. And in fact, that is basic economic 101 doctrine now. It didn't used to be, but it is now. Yeah. And if that's true, that you can't buy prosperity by inflation, what are we doing balancing all, trying, pretending we can balance it all out? What the Federal Reserve can do is maintain reasonable price stability, but that doesn't mean when you're in a recession, obviously you're easy in a recession. <laughs> You don't have to announce that's our dual responsibility, that's your obvious responsibility. <laughs> or if things are booming away, you, you pull back. Uh, so I, uh, I just think this repetition, we've got a dual responsibility, is misleading. And, and what it does do is uh, tends to support the people who say, uh, maybe some in the Federal Reserve, who say, what we need now is a little inflation. 4% might be just nice, that's what they say. And, in Japan, and if we get 4%, we'll pep up the economy, and then we'll go back to price stability. I, I say, good luck on that particular <laughs> approach. Uh, uh, so that's what, I mean, that's really what worries me about the dual mandate. You say, dual mandate, now the dual mandate is to get employment up, so let's inflate. Mm -hmm. We'll worry about inflation some other time. Which brings up... Uh, I don't know that I was suitably eloquent about this, but yeah, I, 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 I... I think so, I think so. Once, uh, about three years ago, you challenged me in a conference and you said, what's this 2% inflation target? What's that about? It's not low enough. Do right. you still feel that way? Well, I feel I would not, in the Federal Reserve, but not, I guess officially, you said they got a yeah, they, particular target. But yes, they have. Have they? Yeah. Well, that's back backward step. But uh, <laughs> a lot of central banks it's become popular. Yeah. The central banks do. What I don't like about it is not that two percent two percent doubles the price level in a generation. I think is too high. But apart from that, it's you know it's reasonable stability. But you know, then if it's one percent, I I think that's great. If things are going along, you got one percent inflation. I wouldn't worry about it. I would declare victory. But no, they got a two percent target, so you got to create a little more inflation. And it's not what central banks ought to be doing. And it, you know, the economy cuts its ups and downs, and the price level has its ups and downs. And one index goes in one direction, another index goes in another direction. Just saying, this is the critical index, which is arbitrary. All of the indexes are arbitrary, and we're going to keep that at two percent. And other countries say it more strongly than or 1% or whatever it is. You know, it's not real. It, it, prices do tend to go up and down depending upon how, how the economy is going. And it, I don't mind going up 3% in the boom so long as you get down to zero in the, in the uh, recession. Uh, so, you know, it's not, a, it's not a major issue, but it seems to me to lend a degree of artificiality and control that you don't really have. And I, I just uh, since you... Yeah. I, I think there is a, see if I'm interpreting correctly, there's a common element both in your discussion of the transparency and what the Fed's going to do in this is 
uh, there's not enough flexibility that things can go up and down. You need to recognize that the world doesn't evolve as you expect it to evolve. You have to react, and you're yeah. worried that. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it, you're, you're basically running a discretionary policy these days. They all are. And the discretion should have limits. Uh, but if you confuse the, I think this dual mandate confuses the issue a little bit. And then you get this, this version now, I hope the Federal Reserve is far away from this. What we ought to do is aim for a nominal GDP target. And we want GDP to be more in other countries than here, but it's a little bit here. We're kind of in a funk or we're not growing as fast as you want to grow. Let's get the GDP in nominal terms up by 5% in two years. To do that, you really, first of all, it implies you could do that if you wanted to. I don't, it's not a criticism of the Federal Reserve. I don't know of any central bank in the world that is six a target out there two or three years ahead as to what the nominal GDP is going to be that has half a chance of meeting the target. You don't have that fine-tuned control. But if you do, you're saying, I don't, you know, you're, by implication, you don't care whether the 5% is 3% growth and 2% inflation or 4% inflation and 1% growth. And suppose that's the way it turns out. Uh, what are you going to do? Another big... I don't like it. <laughs> I gather. I hope the Reserve doesn't adopt that. Interestingly, it was presented, at least in one advocacy piece, as that was advocating it as the Fed's Volcker moment on fighting fighting weakness, that you had shifted targets and that helped the discipline. But I don't think this one would be a Volcker moment. No, no, no. Be an anti-Volcker moment. No, but you could, I mean, the, the Federal Reserve obviously has pushed us beyond what anybody thought you could do and continues to push to liquefy the economy. Yeah. But it can do it in, Presumably making a judgment about what the inflationary implications are and how the economy is doing. And you've got to make that judgment every three months or whenever you meet. And I think that's what you should do instead of saying this is what we're going to do for the next three years. Let me uh, finish up the monetary policy section by talking about or asking you about central bank independence. Do you see the Fed's independence potentially threatened? How and Important is this? What degree of independence does it need? Is this an issue we should be worried about? Uh, yeah, it's an issue that you should be worried about. I, it's not as an intense a threat yet as I thought it might be, but you cannot conduct policies as radically as the Federal Reserve is conducting them, and particularly with the degree of intervention in a particular sector of the economy, which is what's happening, where the government as a whole, and the Federal Reserve as an eager participant, is controlling the mortgage market. The mortgage market is the most important part of the capital market, and it's now government-owned, and partly Federal Reserve-owned. And naturally, say, is that your business? Uh, your business is to regulate the overall supply of liquidity and influence interest rates overall, not to do special things for the mortgage market or the student-loan market or whatever. And the people who want to attack you will say it. There's some justice that this is beyond beyond the Federal Reserve's mandate. And they do say it. Now, I think you'll survive it all right, so long as things don't get worse. But <laughs> if something happens, and there are more problems than people are assuming at the moment, the Federal Reserve is going to be somewhat vulnerable. But this remind me, there are very strong parallels. It's much more complicated now and more difficult, but there are very clear parallels between the time when I first entered the Federal Reserve in 1949, 1950. People forget that at that point the Federal Reserve was keeping interest rates just about where they are now, <laughs> and they'd done it for 15 years. Well, it ended up there, it ended in 15 years then. And people began saying, well, I've got to get this quotation to get it straight. 
Mariner Eccles had been chairman of the Federal Reserve for 19 years or so. Still on the board, and he made a statement in 1948 that I found in a book. He said, the way the Federal Reserve is running policy now it is the greatest contrivance to create inflation in all the history of mankind. <laughs> a pretty strong statement from a chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, and so there was all, and a lot of debate over the independence of the Federal Reserve because at that point, by general consent, it was not independent. It was following the dictates of the Treasury and President Truman, actually, who was dead set against interest rates rising. They found another quotation in the first report of the Council of Economic Advisors just created. It said, we want low interest rates under all conditions, including inflationary situation. Low interest rates are important for the growth of the economy and growth of investment and so forth. And there were questions about the independence of the Federal Reserve. That, and the Federal Reserve then finally had a fight about it and won. Uh, but the question was, okay, they restored their independence, but was that viable over time? And there were two very sizable investigations, which extended beyond the Federal Reserve, but kind of the centerpiece was the Federal Reserve. One in the Congress, and a few years later, one in the private sector. And these were not a slapdash congressional thing. It was a serious investigation because Senator Paul Douglas got control of it. He was an economist, an economist in the, in the Congress, and it was a very responsible uh, inquiry and report, and so was the other. If you read those reports which I glanced at a few days ago, because I've got to give a speech tomorrow or sometime, 90% uh, of what they were recommending was never uh, applied, a lot of detailed recommendations, including uh, unifying banking regulation. <laughs> Both of them were, thought there were too many banking regulators even back then. So a lot of the detailed regulations, uh, recommendations, can go any place. But they both provided very solid support for the importance of an independent Federal Reserve. And given the uncertainty of the period, that was a very important element of support. The Federal Reserve reacted Interestingly enough, obviously you were delighted to have that support, but the Chairman Martin and the board here, they, it's a big fight in the Federal Reserve, and they said the Federal Reserve should avoid all the political entanglements and, and influencing particular parts of the market. We should confine all our operations to short-term money market instruments. Bills only. Bills only, it was called. They, they should only, did we purchase agreements too, but... Uh, should only buy or sell treasury bills, the shortest maturity stuff. And that was doctrine, I've lost track of it, but it was doctrine for 20 years anyway. Uh, it's not doctrine today, for sure. <laughs> uh, but it's a little bit dangerous. Part of the rationale for that approach was that's our role is influencing liquidity and influencing bank reserves and obviously influencing interest, short-term interest rates have an influence, but it's not our job to influence particular sectors of the market. It is not our job to facilitate Treasury financing. People forget about that. When I was new in the Federal Reserve, they were preoccupied with smoothing the market for Treasury financing. Right. It's all gone. Right. Fortunately, right. all gone. Right? Even keeling, it was called. Even keel. You got it right. right. It would be even keel for weeks or months. Right. You're financing every three months, that was, right. Right. was a lot of time. Yeah. But, the, the, you know, I don't remember what the number is, but all this talk about how big the government debt should be now, it was way over 100% of the GDP then, but it was unusual because you just come out of the war with the huge deficits during the war. But there was a lot of sensitivity to interest rates by President Truman and others, and a lot of fear, as you hear now, that, oh my God, if they let interest rates go up, It'll have an impact on the budget that will be destructive. You can read the arguments that were made about not changing the interest rate policy then. You could put them in the Wall Street Journal this morning and you would think it's the same, same argument. Some things never change, I guess. Mm -hmm.
Uh, let's shift a little bit into financial stability, financial reform. Mm -hmm. There are other things in this town that bear there's, your there's name. Some, there's some good, good rules here. That's right. right. <laughs> so I, uh, so I, I have a couple questions on that. Or uh, one is uh, why? What? Why? Why did we? Do we need the Volcker rule? People argue that the proprietary trading ownership of uh, private equity or whatever hedge funds was not a cause of the crisis. So, uh, A, do you disagree with that? And B, well, um, so what, what, why was this necessary? Well, you say it wasn't the cause of the crisis, and I'm not saying this was a kind of basic cause of the crisis, but it was certainly a complication. Uh, you forget about uh, uh, more in European banks and French banks are here, but there were you know, big losses comparable to this loss that J.P. Morgan took from speculative trading, sometimes not by the not intentionally by the banks, you had a rogue trader. But if you've got a lot of traders, you're going to have rogue traders. And they were plenty destabilizing in terms of the two biggest French banks. And you could see what happened to Morgan getting in trouble. It roused a certain amount of question. But uh, it's, a, it's more than a philosophical point, but uh, it gets into this too big to fail argument. Banks are protected. They've been protected forever, but they've been protected because it's felt that they are carrying out necessary operations. They control the payment system. It's very important. You don't think about it, but it's very important. You have confidence in the payment system. When you pay somebody or write a check or make a transfer, it's going to be done all over the world instantaneously almost these days. Uh, they are basic lenders, particularly the small and medium-sized businesses, but even big businesses indirectly. And uh, they provide safe harbor for your liquid balances. And it's important to maintain continuity in all those functions. That's why they're protected, and that's why they've been saved and too big to fail. But is it consistent for the government to have that protection for banks, which these days is worth a lot in dollars and cents because it makes their financing cheaper, so that you can facilitate speculative trading by those banks, which inevitably will get them into trouble, even if it wasn't the primary cause of the crisis. But there are calculations made that the banks lost more money by trading in 2008 than they gained in the whole period from 2000 to 2007. I don't know if the calculation is correct, but they sure lost a lot of money. Uh, and they've gained some recently. But as important as that, what really lies behind this, you cannot, in my view, run an institution that aids and abets a bunch of hot shots out there to gamble in the market with a lot of your money and not have that culture infect the rest of the institution. They begin to why are those guys getting millions of dollars? And some of them made a million dollars this year, and they lost the bank a million dollars the next year. And they, what are they getting so rich about? Well, I'm a good old banker. I've been around forever making loans. I try to make loans carefully. And what do I get paid? I get paid, you know, whatever they pay. But they're not getting, they're not getting extraordinary bonuses. And so they say, well, you know. Uh, I'll tell you part of what that what did contribute to the credit. Well, maybe I can gin up the mortgage market. And I'll oh, get some people out there, some brokers out there, and get some more. We'll package them up. We invented uh, securitization. And boy, can we ramp this up and we'll make big fees and I'll get a big bonus too. And I'm not going to look too carefully about the value of those mortgages. I want to get them out there. And I think it's inevitable that that happens when you try to combine in one organization a particularly freewheeling highly compensated if they do well, incentive to cut corners, uh, and do that with against a, what we think of as a traditional commercial banking mentality that says, you know, how many of you get letters saying from your friendly bank, I keep getting, the relationship is everything. 
You know, the relationship is there. That's what it used to be in central banking. The relationship is nothing in what those people are doing. It's a transaction. It's a counterparty. It's not a customer. And you can't have run the bank management saying the core of this bank is taking care of our relationships and no, we're out there running a gambling operation on the side. So, uh, you know, my proposal is rather modest. It, this is a concern every place. And the British looked at it and came up with a different, but a, an overlapping solution. They said, take all the investment banking function out of the banks, even the customer-related part of them. Take it out of the commercial bank. Seal it off in some other, like a seal the bank off in a subsidiary with what they call ring fences, which it's a bad word. I think ring fences don't to me sound, they sound very permeable. Uh, it's hard to keep the deer out of the garden with a fence. <laughs> I, uh, they ought to say penitentiary wall or something if they're building one. Uh, but it's the same, they're after the same problem. They are talking about electrifying the fence. Yeah, so well, I, 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 when the deer jumps over, he doesn't touch the fence. And so they observe that. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, they have to begin, there are complications in the Volcker role, obviously. I don't think they're unmanageable, but they have the same complications because then they have to draw a line. What is the commercial banking function? What is the investment banking function? Can the twain never meet? Suppose it's the same customer. Uh, suppose they got to make transactions. Who, who's, who's carrying out the payment system? Is it the commercial bank? And these other guys need a payment system too. But you've got a ring fence. They can't do it with the same bank because that. Well, in fact, they'll make exceptions for all these things. So it becomes a ring fence that holds them. Uh, so that's you know, it's a different way of going, trying to get at the same problem. And for the same reasons, basically. So why do you think they're having so much trouble implementing the Volcker Rule? Well, I can give you several explanations. Did you notice how many lobbyists there are down here these days? <laughs> poor congressmen and poor regular. But I think my current hobby horse is you have, depends on how you count, five, six, seven agencies involved in this. And you've got this so-called ESOC, it's another one. And the, I, I don't know if it's actually required by the law, but it's obviously desirable that they all have the same rule and regulation so they get together. The law was passed almost three years ago now, and there's no regulation. Well, it obviously has been heavily lobbied and all the rest and banks are fine. The basic reason in the end, I think, is Getting five or six agencies to agree, you can't do. They've all got their own, what they consider their own mandates, their own management, overlapping responsibilities. And I made this point to a uh, Federal Reserve guy the other day, too many agencies never get together, something's got to be done. I mean, it's just, it's not just my rule, it's derivatives, it's money market fund. But he says, you know, you've mischaracterized the problem. It's not six or seven agencies, it's 32 managing commissioners or board members or whatever. You got to not just get the agency, you got to get all these disparate managing Within board each members, agency, right. commission members. Right. And it's just a recipe for getting nothing done. And I believe that we shouldn't have just one agency, but I'll settle for two. <laughs> That's some chance of getting together. But uh, this really is a disaster. I mean, how can you explain in a, in a democracy, for God's sakes? We passed the law, I would like it or not. The law is pretty plain about what the objective is and the rule is. Three years later, you got no. So, I guess what the matter here. I guess what they need is more GW law students to go into. Well, <laughs> to I, what I worry about. Please not go into lobby. Hey, I'm, I'm worried about what side they're going to be on. Right, right. I want them to go in and help out on the public side and maintain your life on that side of the table. By that time, all this lobbying wealth will be, you know, it all comes back in some ways, you know, to the cost of campaign now. The 
congressmen and senators are so sensitive to how they finance their campaign that it just feeds the, it's a rich Thanksgiving dinner for the lobbyists, oh God. Uh, they're very sensitive to how the campaign dinners and meetings are going to be financed and all the rest. Of it. None of that is new, but it's it's just it's like it's like the size of the Federal Reserve. It's a multiple of, of what it used to be. I come to this town, town now, this metropolitan area. It's the most prosperous city in the United States. What's this business? It used to be government, now it's lobbying. <laughs> I mean, it, it really, it's a problem. It is a problem, I agree. And I think with, uh, that's a, a little bit of an unhappy note to wind up <laughs> on, but I think uh, to some extent, your leadership, the moral compass that you carry with you, eh, you're making a face, but I think we all, we all sense that is uh, just tremendously important in today's Washington as it was in Washington's of past decades. And I uh, thank you for providing leadership from the GW Law School. Thank you for this conversation and uh, for all you've done for our country and the world. Well, thank you.